You're watching the Daily Decrypt. Welcome to Currency Competition, bitches. I am your host, Amanda. Today's episode is brought to you by Node40. There are a lot of things happening in Bitcoin Core development right now, but not all of it is easily digestible at first glance. To get the inside scoop, we've reached out to Andreas Antonopoulos, and we got even more than we bargained for. So, Andreas... You responded to my my shout out, basically my call for a commentator on segregated witness. And you are not a Bitcoin core developer, but you are a man who knows everything about Bitcoin. In fact, <laughs> as it's been said, and as is literally true, you have written the book on mastering Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So. For anybody who doesn't have a sense of who you are, uh, where you're coming from, and why they should listen to you, will you please give us uh, your background? Um, so I am a developer. I'm a computer scientist by trade, and I've uh, I've specialized in security over the years. And I wrote the book Mastering Bitcoin. I'm currently writing the second edition, and part of that is writing about uh, segregated witness. So I've been studying it now for two months and uh, done some shows about it. And I'm writing the chapter on segregated witness for, for the book or the section rather. Uh, so it, it's something I'm very interested in and it's really quite amazing work. So without further ado, uh, I, do have say, I do have a list of questions here for you actually, but naturally the first one is, please tell us what is segregated witness and then after that, let us move into a general discussion of the Bitcoin Core roadmap, if you don't mind. Uh, witness is another word for cryptographic proofs, and uh, the signatures used in Bitcoin are a form of witness. Segregated witness, uh, simply spoken, means uh, separating the signatures from both the transaction data structure and the block data structure into their own separate data structure. Uh, taking the signatures out of the transaction data structure uh, is really what this is about. And it, it has a number of uh, effects when you do that, which are all very, very interesting and very positive for Bitcoin. So segregated witness means sim simply separating signatures out. Okay. And what is, uh, what is the goal? Why segregated witness? Well, um, the, the real goal initially, the creation of segregated witness, was to, to clean up some of the functions of uh, Bitcoin. And it was developed by Peter Wola as a form of uh, transaction malleability fix. Um, because the one thing that's not uh, static within the transaction that can be malleated is the signature itself. Because everything else is usually covered by the signature, so you can't change it without... Uh, effectively invalidating the signature. But the signature itself can be malleated, and a lot of the transaction malleability, most all of it, comes from uh, malleating the signature. Uh, so if you take the signature out of the transaction, then the transaction ID is not based on the signature anymore. Uh, the hash of the transaction, which we use as an ID, is not based on the signature, which means that you can't malleate the transaction ID. That, that's a really big and important development. It helps with chaining transactions, uh, it helps with things like Lightning Network and payment channels, um, mm -hmm. and it resolves a lot of the problems we have with transaction malleability. There is a now, few... Oh, please, uh, please, before you continue, uh, what is transaction malleability in, in simpler terms? Transaction malleability is uh, essentially a quirk in Bitcoin and other cryptographic systems, malleability in general. Uh, where you can make uh, changes, unauthorized changes to a transaction and rebroadcast it with a different transaction ID. You can't change where the funds are coming from or where the funds are going to because that's covered by the signature. But you can make a small modification to the signature. Think of it in simple terms. Let's say that the signature, I'm just going to use a, a simplified example, uh, padding. Let's say that the signature contained the number six. Well, in in the analysis of the algorithm, 6 and 0, 06 are exactly the same. But uh, if you pad a number uh, in a certain way, it will change the fingerprint of that transaction, even though that signature is interpreted in exactly the same way. Um, and so you can modify parts of the signature because they're not covered by the signature um, and produce a transaction with a completely different ID. Uh, and by doing that, you can jam it into the network and cause confusion. Uh, transaction malleability has been blamed for a number of uh, 
thefts at uh, Bitcoin exchanges, where uh, people essentially are, are, are getting a form of double withdrawal uh, using transaction malleability. Um, it also allows you to do denial of service attacks against uh, the network, as well as uh, gum up the works for people who are using payment channels um, or chaining lots of transactions together. Okay. So, with segregated witness being intended to solve the problem of transaction or malleability, um, is it also true that it should allow for more transactions per block, as it will decrease the amount of data required for a transaction? Yes. Yeah, so, one of the interesting side effects of transaction of uh, sorry of segregated witness, mm -hmm. which uh, Peter Will uh, understood once he was developing this, was that uh, you could start counting block size differently and give some capacity increases directly uh, through segregated witness. The idea is really simple. Uh, transactions are kind of the uh, key that opens the door uh, to get into the blockchain, right? So you need a, a, a signature uh, on the transaction in order to validate it before it's mined into the blockchain. But once you, once a transaction is in the blockchain, uh, nobody really checks those signatures ever again. Uh, we don't go back and check signatures from transactions that happened a long time ago. They're buried in the blockchain. They've been validated. Done. So the, the signature is only used once for validation. Here's a simple example. Uh, when you write a paper check, which will be familiar to many Americans, although in, in the rest of the world people have moved beyond them, um, you have the option to go to your online banking system and look at the photo of the check after it's been submitted by whoever cashed that check. Right? So you can look and check that the signature on the check is correct and it was properly endorsed. Etc. Now that's not part of your bank statement, and you don't really need it unless you're verifying that that check was properly cashed and properly signed. And and once you're done, it sits there; it just hangs around. Um, the same thing applies to signatures. So what if you could simply take them out of the transaction? The other interesting thing to note is that signatures are actually 75 percent in some transactions of 75 percent of the total space. Um, yes. And the more we use multisig. Uh, the bigger the signatures get, because uh, a lot of the data from multisig actually gets moved to the input signing side of the mm -hmm. transaction. Okay. So, um, with large, complex scripts and multi-signature have very large signatures, and they take up a lot of space in the blockchain. And nobody ever cares about them after they've been validated. All right. So that is sounding like a lot of pros. A lot of pros for segregated witness. Does does it have any cons, or is it all pro? Are there any trade-offs for this development? Well, actually, I'm not done with the pros, and that's really where this gets interesting. Holy because, Hannah! Yeah, and um, I, I I don't know if there are any cons, and we have to think about that critically. But for the time being, you know, really, this is a, a quite a quite a significant positive development and innovation for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So the other part of segregated witness, the reason it wasn't considered until now, is because fixing malleability and removing transaction signatures from the transactions is something that requires an overhaul of the network, and and it was assumed that this would have to be by a hard fork. Um, however, at some point in November, uh, Luke Dash Jr. Uh, figured out uh, a way of doing this with a soft fork. It's a bit of a trick, but it's actually a really interesting trick. And what it does is it allows you to start putting a version number in front of the Bitcoin script. And what that does is it allows you to upgrade the version number of a script while old clients can't see the difference and still validate transactions perfectly, which is the definition of a soft fork. Uh, old clients continue to operate without upgrading. Um, they're just validating a bit less than they were before. And new clients can now upgrade scripts. Now, this trick has enormous implications because once you conversion scripts, you can now introduce dozens and dozens of soft forks in parallel to change all kinds of the scripting mechanism. Already we've seen two proposals that are really, really innovative. One is to reduce the burden of the signature validation by turning it from an order n squared operation to an order n operation, uh, from exponential to linear. Um, and the other one is uh, to change the, the, the format the check sig uh, uses in the script operator to allow offline devices like hardware wallets to be able to validate inputs better. So th these are esoteric things, but they're upgrades that uh, people have been really, really uh, trying to find a way to make to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, but all of these 
previously required a hard fork. Mm -hmm. um, so this trick can, is not just use, useful for SegWit, it's useful for introducing all kinds of things through soft fork um, and uh, really, really accelerating the innovation in the scripting language. And all, all together, these three aspects of segregated witness, transaction malleability, um, increasing the capacity of the block by removing a lot of the information that's not useful after validation, and at the same time, um, upgrading version scripts so you can do soft forks, make it a, a truly compelling feature that solves a lot of problems. Um, just one more example. Um, Gregory Maxwell has developed a system called Confidential Transactions, which is a very, very highly secure way of encrypting the information in a transaction so you can't even see what value is being transmitted or exchanged by that transaction. Um, and that is being implemented in a sidechain. Well, now you can do confidential transactions as a soft fork directly in Bitcoin. Uh, and it's just one of the examples of what you can do with these tricks. Um, so what segregated is... witness, really interesting, lots of facets to it, the mm -hmm. least of which is separating the signatures. So let me see if I understand uh, the deployment of a soft fork correctly. Anyone running a node who was interested in participating in that soft fork would simply choose to run the same, the, bit, the same, the Bitcoin Core software, but with a slight variance in it, and it would be fully compatible with all of the rest of the nodes. But with the slight variance, it would be basically how would a how would a soft fork would a majority of nodes need to be running that soft fork variance, and then it becomes the thing or how do, how does a soft fork become the thing well th there's two aspects to it the, the first one is soft fork activation which is usually done by a voting process um and here we have another innovation called version bits or bip9 which is being introduced in parallel which allows you to have multiple soft forks um what it allows you to do is say if this bit in the version of the block is set that means that you want to implement this soft fork the miners then set that bit and once 75% of the blocks uh, have that bit set, uh, you activate the feature. And then once 95% of the blocks have that bit set, that feature is then enforced uh, for validation. So it's a two-step voting process. You reach a quorum and then you, you pass the vote, essentially. We've done that successfully with uh, three bits so far, uh, mm -hmm. the most recent being check lock time verify. Um, and these incremental features can now be voted on in parallel. Um, previously, it would Im involve an increase in the block version from, say, block version 3 to block version 4, uh, as was done with check lock time verify. But now you turn the block version into a bit field, so you can do these in parallel. Three okay. soft forks have happened. Uh, one with increasing the block version from 1 to 2, mm -hmm. and then again from 2 to 3 uh, to introduce a transaction malleability fix, and mm -hmm. then from 3 to 4 to introduce check lock time verify. Um, but what this would do is, is previously you could only have one happening um, at a time, and the vote had to be completed. And it was actually difficult to reject one and then move to the next. Um, with the, the new proposal, you can actually do multiple soft forks simultaneously, independent votes, and reject one, accept the other, etc. So that's the activation of the soft fork. But the important feature of a soft fork is that it is forwards compatible. Let me give you an example, which I read on, uh, I think, one of the postings by one of the core developers. Uh, if you want to open, uh, for example, an old Word document, um, I can open Word 1998 uh, in my current version of Microsoft Word. That's backwards compatibility. So it recognizes old formats. Forwards compatibility is when a version of Microsoft Word 1998 that hasn't upgraded can still open the documents that we use today in a certain way. Um, it may lose some of the information, may not see the whole document, it may not be able to understand some of the new features, but it can still open the document. Soft forks are a form of forwards compatibility, meaning that clients that have not upgraded yet to the new code uh, don't break. They don't stop validating. They can still remain validating on the correct consensus chain. It's just that they're validating less information. They're not seeing some of the new features. Um, but they're able to ignore them and continue validating. A hard fork, by comparison, means that if you don't upgrade, you can no longer validate blocks, and you are no longer part of the consensus chain. So if you don't upgrade, you're off the network. Um, are there any risks involved to soft forks? 
Well, th there are uh, uh, there are some risks. Um, uh, there are some risks involving uh, compatibility. So any change to the network obviously affects the software. If there are bugs that can cause problems, although these features are are often tested on a separate testnet. In fact, uh, segregated witness testnet has been running now for more than a month. And that, that allows us to, to, to make sure that before you upgrade the code, there's a, a lot of testing. And the miners have become very conservative about upgrading uh, code. Uh, it's generally believed that soft forks are less dangerous than hard forks. Mm -hmm. But the problem that some people identify here is that they don't force the network to upgrade, which means that you, you can end up with a lot of old clients that are gradually validating less and less and less and less. Previously, they'd get kicked off the network. Um, so some people want a more hard approach. They, they mm -hmm. want you to either upgrade or get off the network. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's really a philosophical disagreement rather than a technical issue. So I have, you've brought me to a question that I didn't even anticipate myself asking, but you used uh, when you were talking about this confidential transactions from Gregory Maxwell as a side chain, what in the hell is a side chain. Like I thought that side chains were still perhaps like highly theoretical. I've tried to look into them and just like blah. Like are side chains real? Is is a side chain oh, something I could use today? I, absolutely. Um, so uh, side chains. The first side chain uh, called Elements Alpha was launched about uh, I think about six months ago. Uh, it's been running since. It has. Uh, more than a dozen uh, distinct features that are experimental features. Basically, it's like a sandbox where people can create a testnet with advanced features where they can experiment with new capabilities in Bitcoin. And on that testnet, people have developed a lot of things, including Check Lock Time Verify essentially got its preview on elements uh, and then uh, got implemented in the main chain. Um, confidential transactions, and many malleability fixes and, and other things like that. Um, now, at the moment, sidechains are implementing somewhat of a two-way peg, meaning you can move Bitcoin into the sidechain and then back. So you can move uh, main chain Bitcoin into elements Bitcoin and then from elements Bitcoin back. And um, these sidechains live on the Bitcoin blockchain. No, they're they're parallel. They're they're chains to the side of Bitcoin. Chains uh, to the side. What, what they have essentially is a two-way. Uh, connector that allows you to move Bitcoin from the Bitcoin main chain to a side chain, any side chain, and then back. Um, and, are they and still running is, on the same infrastructure, however, like same nodes, same miners, or are they their own network? They're, they're their own network. Uh, they're they're, own they're network. essentially uh, they're essentially an alt chain, uh, but with a with a two way decentralized exchange capability between them and the main Bitcoin chain. Um, so who's hosting the infrastructure for elements? Like that, that is, this is new information for me. Uh, yes, uh, th that's hosted uh, primarily by uh, Blockstream uh, and a number of participants into that. Uh, a number of exchanges are building a new uh, intra exchange uh, liquidity pool called Liquid on a side chain, for example. Again, that's right. something that Blockstream has. Started now. Up to now, sidechains um, would have required uh, a complex process to be fully integrated into Bitcoin. Uh, but with this new trick, you can actually introduce the the mechanism for sidechains through a soft fork too. So all of this is going to lead to an enormous increase in the speed of innovation in the network. Uh, a lot of things that uh, were very difficult to do can be done now. And a lot of the little glitches and quirks of Bitcoin uh, can be ironed out in, in, in a way that uh, previously involved a very complex hard fork dance mm -hmm. and how it could be done by soft fork. This is really exciting news. I think 2016, we're going to see uh, an absolute explosion of innovation in, in the Bitcoin uh, uh, software. So now is Blockstream and their affiliates, are they looking for more infrastructure hosting? I mean, could I become a node of the elements side chain or or what are they looking how are they looking to run their infrastructure oh it's it's very similar to downloading bitcoin core and running it i, I run an elements alpha node as myself so you you basically download the software compile it and run it and you're running a node 
Uh, I run a Bitcoin core node. I also run an Elements Alpha node. I, I run a, a number of different nodes just to test software out and to, to see how it's working. So yes, anyone can participate. Again, it's a completely open decentralized uh, network. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're going to see over time this allowing essentially a lot of the things that are very separate today, like all of the altcoins and um, other chains that are out there that do things like um, Factum, like document registries or Ethereum for contracts or um, Dash or any of the other altcoins. Uh, all of those could actually end up working as sidechains to Bitcoin, which would then allow you to seamlessly transfer from one asset to the other without using a centralized exchange in, in a completely decentralized programmatic manner. Hmm. So that brings me to another question I wanted to ask you. In your personal vision of the crypto sphere in, say, four years, do you see people choosing to implement new ideas via side chains of Bitcoin? Or do you see people finding it more profitable to create their own networks, altcoins? How, how do you see all of this playing out? Well, this has always been a, a really big conundrum for people who want to implement features because it's very difficult to bootstrap a network with a level of security. Uh, Bitcoin recently, just a, a last week, passed uh, one exa hash per second of security. Um, that kind of infrastructure is very difficult to, to build. It took seven years for Bitcoin to build it, and because of the network effect, it's very difficult for another chain to get that level of security. And that's a good thing to have. So the network effect is very powerful. So for developers, the real question is, is my feature compelling enough and different enough and hard enough to implement in Bitcoin that it's mm -hmm. worth doing an alt chain with all of the bootstrapping challenges that brings? Mm -hmm. Or is it something that potentially we could do on Bitcoin and gain the advantage of the network effect and security? Well, that question has become a lot easier to answer uh, because through side chains and these new soft fork mechanisms, a lot more things that previously could not be done on Bitcoin can be done on Bitcoin directly or uh, tied to Bitcoin in a two-way peg. Uh, that's going to make it much more compelling uh, to build on the network effect of Bitcoin. Now, that doesn't mean that the innovation all moves to Bitcoin or that, in fact, it encourages more innovation on altchains. Because if you can build an altcoin that, that is specialized and differentiated in a way that isn't related to Bitcoin, maybe it has a different monetary policy uh, or a different focus, say privacy, as as uh, Dash and Zero Cash have. Mm -hmm. But you can also have a completely seamless decentralized two-way exchange with Bitcoin to use it as a reserve currency. Well, uh, that's even better. So it's going to accelerate innovation in altcoins. It's going to accelerate innovation on Bitcoin. I always look at this as one big ecosystem. None of these things are competitive. What we're competing with is the is the old obsolete idea of monopoly currencies. We live in a world where monopoly currencies are neither necessary uh, nor suitable. And so we're past that. There is not going to be one winner to take all. Uh, it's all about choice now. I, I can't tell you how happy I am to that, hear you express that sentiment uh, because I feel the same. Uh, and I, I have one more question to ask you in terms of network cryptocurrency security. Um, what is the balance, if I could even phrase it this way, between like the the exa hashes or whatever, basically the hashing power of a network versus its actual node count, like actual instances of its blockchain. How do you see both or either of those as affecting security? Um, node count is is a lot less important uh, in Bitcoin. For example, we have seen over time um, in in the beginning, in order to run a wallet, you needed a Bitcoin core, so you had a node. So Using a wallet involved having a node, so people had a lot of nodes in the beginning, and gradually, as as you could run lightweight clients without a node uh, for wallets, uh, the number of nodes has gone down. There, there's probably about five thousand nodes on the Bitcoin network at the moment. I haven't looked at the numbers. That's the ones we know are listening. Um, for example, all of the nodes I'm running are not visible uh, in that count, but they're still running and validating transactions. Nodes are important for validating transactions, but what's most important for security? is is the the amount of proof of work that you can put behind it because that's what makes it an immutable record mm -hmm. um validating on the way to getting the information to miners 
uh, is important for a number of reasons for propagation. But you know, the Bitcoin network has no problem with propagation. Within a few seconds, a transaction floods the entire global network, is reachable to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, connectivity is very nice. So we're not having any problems with, with latency or propagation issues. The number of nodes is fine. Um, and that's why it's difficult to compete with that network effect because uh, increasing the number of nodes is relatively easy if you it doesn't require a lot of infrastructure. Actually, mm -hmm. building a proof of work infrastructure the size of Bitcoin involves hundreds of millions of dollars of physical investment in plants. It's it's factories basically, um, and and that's a that's a compelling advantage that Bitcoin has in terms of security. But I think over time we're going to see both of those become more decentralized. The number of nodes and the number of miners as mm -hmm. new technologies that make mining easier, um, more consumer oriented and, and low level, uh, as well as new technologies that make running a node easier. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to ask for about six more minutes of your time. Firstly, you bring up uh, the security of proof of work. And I would like to hear in your estimation, what, what, Tell, what is proof of work versus proof of stake? What is your estimation of the security possibilities or non possibilities of proof of stake? Um, proof of stake hasn't been proven at scale yet. Uh, and that doesn't mean it's, it's not secure. It just doesn't mean mm -hmm. it hasn't been proven at scale yet. Uh, mm -hmm. The key word being yet. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's fascinating. Proof of stake has its own challenges. Um, if you take a very simplified approach to proof of stake, it can create a situation where it, uh, it disrupts the liquidity. Uh, because if you have to stake coins and not move them, uh, that reduces the liquidity and velocity of the, of the, of the currency itself. Um, and it also has kind of a, a problem where it, it encourages a situation where the rich may get richer. So having coin gives you coin, which allows you to have more coin and get more coin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but that doesn't mean there aren't variants of proof of stake that, that could work. This, keep in mind, this is brand new science. One invention in 2009 opened the door and created a whole new science, that of consensus algorithms. It took a long time to get to proof of work. And it's proven to work at a scale of uh, double-digit billions of dollars security. Uh, that's what we know. Uh, whether proof of stake can do that, we don't know. But here's the interesting thing: uh, if proof of stake does end up doing that, uh, mm -hmm. well, there's some some good arguments to be made that you could introduce these features either as a sidechain or even directly into Bitcoin uh, and create hy hybrid systems. This is by no means. Um, a system that cannot change. So uh, we're going to see a lot more innovation in Bitcoin. And every time you think that things have settled down, something mm -hmm. comes out of left field, like Segwit, and mm -hmm. and just it's it's another black swan. Uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are a black swan incubator. And just when you think you've seen it all, you know, hang on to your hats. Here comes another revolution within the revolution. Right? That's why I feel such job security in the daily decrypt. I've had people ask me before, people not familiar with cryptocurrency, like, well, where do you find the stories? Are, are you afraid you'll run out of them? And just, just like you, it's like, no, I know something is going to come out of left field like at least once a week, basically. Right. Yeah. And that's not even counting all of the drama and gossip. But if you, if you just focus on the technology, even there, the, the amount of uh, stuff that's happening is, is just incredible. Well, as closing, Andreas, if you'll uh, allow me to ask you to share, uh, you you mentioned that you believe that monopoly currencies have no place in the future and that choice in currency is the future. And you, I believe, have only too intimate of an experience in what monopoly currencies can really do in that you are from Greece and your parents still live in Greece. Um, if you would be willing to share, I would like for you to talk about how you and yours were affected by the banking crisis in Greece over the last year. Uh, w which one of the banking crises in Greece? Because <laughs> I mean, th this is really the story of the rest of the world. Um, if you if you live in uh, one of maybe ten or fifteen countries that have had mostly stable currencies for most of the last fifty or sixty years. Um, with the exception of those who remember the 1970s oil crisis in the United States, the hyperinflation that came from that, um, 
you know, since the early 80s, um, we've had a pretty stable dollar. Uh, that is not the norm. That is the exception. And if you talk to people from other countries, you realize that uh, the experience of central banking bringing uh, boom and bust cycles with hyperinflation and currency collapse and massive devaluation uh, has happened pretty much everywhere else in the world, and not just once. Uh, in Greece, it's something that has happened three times in my lifetime. And uh, every time caused a generational level loss of wealth uh, for the middle class. So wiped out um, an entire generation's wealth, back to zero, reset. And when that happens to you in your 30s or 40s, um, you know, it might be something you can come back from, but when it happens to you in your 50s and 60s, you know, how do you rebuild from zero at that age? Uh, so that's happened to, to my family and my parents uh, three times in my life. In Greece, it's happened in Cyprus, in Argentina, in, in Venezuela, in Brazil, in uh, Argentina, uh, throughout Latin America, most of Southeast Asia, um, you know, and, and in, in every country in Africa. So the exception is currency stability. The rule is currency chaos that wipes out a generation's wealth two or three times in their lifetime. Um, and so that experience has always informed me because I don't buy the fairy tale. I don't believe the story of stable, centrally managed currencies uh, because I've seen otherwise. And um, it's it's hard to explain to people who have grown up with this uh, kind of uh, privileged, sheltered experience of the U.S. dollar, um, the British pound, and uh, the Deutsche Mark, a few other currencies. You know, and they've seen thirty or forty years of uh, stability. Uh, well, don't worry. <laughs> It's coming here too. So um, you know we're now in a time of unprecedented global currency uh, wars and currency volatility, uh, and people are are beginning to realize that central planning, just as it doesn't work in other aspects of the economy, certainly doesn't work uh, in currencies. We're all Greeks now. Well, it has been a pleasure. And thank you for your time. Anyone who wants to contact Andreas can find his bio and information at antonopolis.com. Yes, and also the uh, book, uh, Mastering Bitcoin, uh, is available on bitcoinbook.info. It's an open source license, so you can download and read it for free. And it's what? Now, it's now available in seven languages, translated by volunteers into French, Italian, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, Brazilian, uh, and uh, Japanese and Hungarian. Um, we have a vol group of volunteers working on uh, 34 languages in total. Uh, and I'm going to keep bringing those. You can download them for free on bitcoinbook.info. Excellent. Well, we look forward to uh, your, your forthcoming chapters uh, to the addendum of your book on segregated witness and other things. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Today's episode has been brought to you by Node40, who provides hosting for Dash's second tier of masternodes. Node40 takes care of the software, hardware, and bandwidth requirements of running a masternode. They're also the world's first merchant to integrate with Dash's evolution for easier billing and payments. You can learn more and talk to their support staff at any time at node40.com. If you are a lover of audio, you may have noticed a disruption in the Daily Decrypts podcast recently. Well, no more fear. It is back in action, and you can listen to these interviews audio only. Enjoy. You're welcome. Have a great day. Oh.